the account of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Please stand for our opening hymn. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, beginning at verse 17. See, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. 
They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, power, and authority. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Another account of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ as recorded in the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they had come back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated and join me in prayer. Lord God, we're grateful for your words before us this day. Thank you for a beautiful sunrise. Remembrance of perhaps that first resurrection day that you came from the tomb. And we're grateful for it. Thanks for the opportunity to hear today a word of hope, a word that we are most desperate for, many of us. And so we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So how are you feeling today? Yeah, good. It's a good day, isn't it? I woke up early this morning, of course, and saw the sun, and I don't think I've seen it for a while, but it's still in the heavens, apparently. We're still moving our way around it this year. I anticipated a fuller church today, and what a gift it is to be together. It's been many years, in fact, since we've gathered like this, too full. And I'm looking forward to all the, the celebrations and the food that I get to eat and the nice wines that I get to share with family and friends this afternoon. 
But I've got to be honest, it's been a while since I felt like this. How about you? Has it been a little bit? It seems, at least, that life is pretty tough as we know it. And that life kind of came crashing down for me on Monday, Thursday. Those of you who were here in worship probably recognized that God was doing something in me. And I wasn't ready for it. I'm a trained professional, so I say. Just ask me. (laughs) And I was losing it at the end of the service. I couldn't even get myself to pray our closing prayer and give a benediction. It was surprising. I wasn't ready for it. But I almost felt as if two years of difficulty and hardship and maybe even some depression and anxiety were heaped on me that day. But that's not why I was in that state. That's not why I was crying somewhat uncontrollably, uncontrollably not able to pray. No, the reason that I was in that space was because we were celebrating that Jesus removes all of that stuff. Monday, Thursday is a reminder to us, as Jesus gave it to his disciples, you are to love one another. And I was overwhelmed with the love of God. It was hope, really, that was in me, not despair. And I hope today that's what we're feeling together is hope. And we are in desperate need for hope, aren't we? Penn State did a survey at the end of 2021, and the survey results came out in 2022. These are hot off the press. They entitled the survey, Mood of the Nation. Any idea how that came out? (laughs) Yeah, of course, you know how it came out. Mood of the Nation. (laughs) It turns out that we're worried and concerned and lack hope in a lot of different areas, but three stood out. Politics, surprise, surprise, surprise. Pandemic, economy, and at the end of 2021, not yet war. And so we add that to the mix of our mood. The survey says that 84% of Americans are extremely or very worried. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hands, but I know that those statistics hold true here in our congregation as well. 42% of Americans are extremely or very hopeful. That's not very many, 42. And then 26 of Americans say, get this, nothing, nothing makes them hopeful. That's one in four. Now, I'm no math wizard, but that's not very good. (laughs) One in four. We are worried. We are in desperate need of hope. And guess what? Easter reminds us that we have hope in this world and beyond. You see, the word I want to communicate to you today, and and I'm not going to hold this back. I'm going to give you my agenda right up front. (laughs) And that word is that Easter resurrects hope. I expect that you will leave today with a new hope in your hearts. I expect that you'll leave today working, or more importantly, God working in you, this hope that comes through the resurrection of Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, the Apostle Paul, in speaking of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, says this, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, 
we are of all people most to be pitied. He's talking to the church. He's talking to us. If this is as good as it gets, well, we are to be pitied first and foremost. Those of us who think and believe that it's going to get better. And so I think that the church will rise up. Maybe it's not a prophetic word. I don't know. I don't presume that. But I believe if there's going to be hope that's resurrected in society today, it's got to start in the church with you. Because the resurrection speaks to hope. If Jesus only died, bah. but he did not only die. When we greet each other on Easter, we have, many of us, this tradition of saying, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Christ is risen indeed. And where does that come from? It's actually from 1 Corinthians. Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Christ has risen. Oh, come on, man. Oh, boy. I'm trying my best up here. <laughs> Christ has risen. Hallelujah. The crucifixion is not the end of the story, my friends, and we must proclaim this truth. So what does it look like when we live the resurrected hope of Jesus Christ? Well, first, we are reminded that Easter resurrects a hope for a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, Easter is great. I think celebrating together on Easter brings hope. I think most of our nation will be celebrating today in the hope of the resurrection. But at the end of the day... What's going to last? I suggest to you, it's not bunnies and baskets, chocolate and candy, family and food. That's not going to be enough to sustain us. But resurrected hope will be. New heavens and a new earth. I love this reading that Pastor Paul read for us from Isaiah, which is a reading for the future. This is a, a sign of the things to come as the prophet speaks the word of God. And in verses 17 through 19, you might have picked up that the prophet Isaiah envisions a new heaven and a new earth where former things are not remembered or mindful. Boy, there's so many things I want to forget. <laughs> Most of them, I lived in college. Land will be a delight and people a joy. God will delight in his people. Weeping and crying will be no more. This is the promise that Easter gives us. Easter resurrects a new hope for a heavens and an earth that's different than the heavens and the earth we live. You know, many believe that heaven is this ethereal place where we float around like these little spirit balls and greet each other and somehow live in our spirit selves. But what Easter reminds us of is that our resurrection, like Jesus, is a bodily resurrection. When the women came to the tomb and Jesus greeted them, was he a little floating ball? Okay, not rhetorical, right? He was, do it with me. He was not a floating ball. <laughs> he was not just brilliant light. In fact, the other heavenly beings that were there were humanoid. They looked like lightning. They emanated God's light, but they were angels. And Jesus himself was recognizable. When Mary finally turned to Jesus and he called her name Mary, if we continued in the story, she recognizes him. Ours, too, is a bodily resurrection. And we are going to be raised in the heavens and the earth. This earth will be redeemed. 
You know, we think of this uh, apocalyptic, cataclysmic event that's going to blow the planet apart. That's not how it's going to (laughs) go. This earth will be redeemed. C.S. Lewis, in his little book called The Great Divorce, which has nothing to do with divorce, (laughs) but Lewis's understanding of what the new heavens and earth look like, Lewis talks about a deeper, more tangible feeling earth. The grass is squishy. The smells are intense and deep. The skyline is way further out and vast. This is the hope that resurrection brings for new heavens and a new earth. We pray peace on earth. Keep praying it. It's going to come. But only after Christ returns. Number two, Easter resurrects a hope for a joy-filled, meaningful life. Today, starting now. You know, it's hard to wait. I don't know about you, but I'm not a very patient person. (laughs) It's hard to wait. But as Isaiah prophesies, he prophesies that, yes, there will be to come a new heavens and a new earth, but there's also, as God's kingdom breaks into this world, a life that we can live that's joy-filled and meaningful. There will be housing and food for all. There will be growth that is commonplace. Our work can be enjoyed and celebrated. There will be no more misfortune. There will be blessing for them and their descendants. This is a picture of both what's to come and what can be today. And so we're excited. We have hope again that in the resurrection of Jesus, he makes all things new. And then lastly, Easter resurrects a hope for relational peace and reconciliation. Relationships, friends, are the most important in all of life. Not only our relationship with God, but our relationship with each other. And we see those relationships over the last two years having been broken down. But we're back. (laughs) At least we can be. Isaiah prophesies that God will answer before we call upon him. That God will hear us while we are still speaking. That the wolf and the lamb will feed together. That lion and ox will eat straw. That dust will be the serpent's food. And that no harm or destruction will come. What a great picture of hope. And we are desperate for it. Penn State didn't have to do their survey if they just called me. (laughs) I could have told them. (laughs) So could you, by the way. (laughs) We are desperate for hope. We are dying for hope. And we have it in the resurrected Christ. So yeah, celebrate today. With bunnies and baskets, with chocolate and candy, with family and food. But tomorrow, I guarantee you, it's going to take more. So cling to the resurrected Christ. And as Paul encourages the church at Corinth, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, I felt that. I lived it. And so do you. Yet inwardly, Paul says, we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We need more today than our normal Easter (laughs) pick-me-up. 
bunnies and baskets, chocolate and candy, family and food. We need resurrected hope, and we have it in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Let us join together now in confessing our faith as found there in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.